Hey, Cypher here. Today I want to talk about a subject that hit fairly close to home. As most of you all know, Las Vegas was hit by one of the biggest massacres in recent history, at least in the United States. And having grown up there, it's kind of an important subject. I had enough time to kind of mull over what I want to say about it. So today I'm going to talk about how studying history, especially local history and when something like this happens, changes your viewpoint necessarily. And I've got a lot of different things to say about this particular one. Firstly, I made an entire episode on Las Vegas history. I actually think it's one of my best episodes, but it seems like it just isn't popular for some reason. But it's well worth checking out if you haven't seen it. So when you study history, you kind of do the same thing that sociologists do, and you try to understand the structure of the civilization that you're studying. In this particular case, an entire city. And how it works. A lot of Las Vegans can attest to what I'm going to say, but you get a deeper sense of it when you actually have to go and study it. So something that's unique about Las Vegas, as opposed to basically any other city in the US, and possibly the world, is that it's really new. Most of the population came in in the last 25 years. It's been the fastest growing city in the US for well over a decade, with a minor exception. As such, there isn't this dichotomy between people who have been living there for generations and people who have just moved in. Native versus non-native isn't so much of a difference. For instance, I wasn't born there, but I grew up there for a good almost 20 years. And that means that I have pretty much the same experience as anyone else who was growing up at that time. And so there's this weird unanimity that comes with that kind of experience. The people who have been there for a couple of generations or so are a relative rarity, and even the ones who were born there pretty much share the same experience with those who weren't. So if you've been there for two or three years, by that point you're a local. There's very few cities that are like that. And then, of course, there's the fact that it's the entertainment capital of the world, which means all locals want to get connections to the point that they can go to the strip, go to have fun, but, you know, not have to pay as much as, you know, those visitors. The tourists pay our state income tax, not us. But as a component of that, everybody kind of generates these connections. So even though it's a city of two million people, everyone knows each other by a couple of degrees. Whereas you could look at like Seattle and not see the same kind of similarity. And that makes for a very interesting dynamic, especially in the wake of such a horrific event. And mind you, most of the victims of this shooting were actually visitors. But there was, of course, still a large proportion who were locals. And as I said, the line between the two gets pretty blurry when you start talking about how long these people have been in the valley in the first place. So I was on the strip only a week after the event, and there were several memorials going up. And having family who works for Clark County, I can tell you these are completely spontaneous. Much of which will be gathered and sent to the Clark County Museum once it's been allowed to be there for long enough. One of the memorials was the typical, you know, bunch of candles on a street corner. And then there was the Las Vegas sign, which right behind it had a big old flag put up behind it saying Vegas Strong, which has become somewhat of a theme saying in the wake of this disaster. And then right behind all of that was a whole row of white crosses just sitting on the astroturf that's behind the sign. And that's a pretty powerful symbol when you put a flag saying Vegas Strong right in front of a whole bunch of white crosses. Now they shut down the street in front of the Mandalay Bay for a whole two days, and that's actually a pretty big deal when it comes to Las Vegas because, well, that's the main avenue. But of course, Vegas bounces back real quick. And that's something that we've seen before with Las Vegas. You see, this isn't the deadliest event to happen on the Strip. That would be the MGM fire, which killed more than 80 people, as opposed to this one during 60, but of course, a fire is a lot different from somebody purposely killing people. 
But just as with the MGM fire, things bounced back really quickly. And that's how Vegas rolls. Unbeknownst to even a lot of locals, this isn't the first time that we've seen mass killing. In fact, I wrote my first article, ever, on one of those mass killers. In the Las Vegas episode, I didn't really get to talk about these guys because, well, they don't really fit into the story that was being told. I did talk about how Stuart, the owner of the Las Vegas Rancho, was killed at one point during a shootout, but I really couldn't talk about Avote, Kehoe, Mawawich, and Mouse in that episode. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about the other mass killers of Southern Nevada. So the first one, and actually all subsequent ones, was an American Indian. He got in a gambling dispute in El Dorado Canyon in the late 1880s and ended up shooting the mailman. Of course, the mailman died and Mawawich fled. But another dude named Avote ended up having to go after him. At that point, it was somewhat of a Paiute tradition to make relatives go out and punish their relatives for wrongdoing. So Avote was tasked with going out and killing Mawawich, which of course he did. Fast forward a little bit, and Avote ends up being the next killer. No one really knows why he snapped, but one night he just went out and killed five people. Just snapped and went on a shooting spree. Luckily, at that point, El Dorado Canyon was sparsely populated, so he had to do a lot of running that night to get from place to place. One of his victims happened to be named Nelson, and they named the camp that Nelson was running after Nelson. So Nelson, Nevada is actually named after one of the victims of Avote. And yeah, of course, they took out Avote and, you know, he was done that night. And then up in the ranchos of Clark County, which wasn't Clark County at that point, it was still Lincoln County, another rogue Indian named Mouse went on a killing spree. If I remember correctly, he killed two people on a rancho, and then they sent an entire hunting party after him, or posse, whatever you want to call it. But he was a good half a day's ride ahead of them, so they got in this long chase through the mountains and valleys of Nevada, trying to catch this guy. He was eventually killed in a gunfight. Now, Mawawich, Avote, Mouse, these guys were all rogue Indians in the late 19th century, but we have to wait a decade to get to what was at that point Nevada's worst serial killer. His name was Kehoe, and he worked as a wood gatherer for the mines in El Dorado Canyon. Once again, we don't know why he went crazy, but he very much did. Kehoe does mean grumbler, so that might mean something, but we don't really know. He also had an affinity with taking people's shoes and had a uh, lame leg. We don't really know much about the dude, but one night he went crazy and shot the night guard who was on duty in El Dorado Canyon. In fact, he took his badge and went off into the night. It was figured out that it was Kehoe who quickly ended up adding more deaths to his roster. He would periodically swoop in and kill somebody without seemingly any reason, except for the few cases that we can see that he killed somebody specifically to get their boots. So from 1910 to 1919, Kehoe became somewhat of the boogeyman of Southern Nevada. There was a bounty put out on his head, but, you know, couldn't find him. All the posses that went after him were pretty inept. By my tally, he killed between 11 and 25 people. The number's hazy because he was killing prospectors and, you know, some of these guys end up being shot by other people and then blamed on Kehoe. In 1919, he capped off all of his murders with the murder of a lady who was just tending her garden. He might have murdered two prospectors on the way away from the murder scene, but once again, we don't know. 
But that would seem to be where Kiho's story ends. He just went off into the desert and then was never seen again. Except for... That's not exactly the truth. He was never seen alive. He hid for two decades out in the desert. Sheriff White, the person who had actually led the 1919 posse to go and try to find Kehoe after the murder of Maud Douglas, said that he saw Kehoe on the streets of Vegas one day, but wasn't able to catch him. We don't know the veracity of this story, of course, but it's an interesting idea because Kehoe's body was found. In 1940, some prospectors found his body in a cave near the Colorado River. He had apparently been stung by a rattlesnake and died out there, and his body had become somewhat mummified. The newspapers ran it as him being the Mad Mummy. Interestingly enough, among his belongings in the cave was found the original badge that he stole from his first murder, along with things like TNT from the Hoover Dam site proving that he had been living out there pretty well for a long time. So once again, you would think that's the end of the story. But Kehoe's actually mostly interesting because of what happened after his death. Because his body was mummified just by the desert. So eventually the Elks Lodge got a hold of his body and ended up making a display of it, along with, you know, all the guns and stuff that were found in the cave. At this point, a touristy celebration was being created called Hell Dorado Days. Basically, Las Vegas' kind of Wild West show. And it would often incorporate a parade and things like that. Kehoe became a key attraction in this. In fact, at one point, and I have tried to find this photo, but I just can't find it, he apparently rode down the street in an open car right next to the city's mayor. Literally a mummy of the worst serial killer in Nevada up to that point, sitting next to the mayor as they roll down the street. No joke. And weirder things even happened after that. After the Helderado days were discontinued, the Elks Lodge wanted to get rid of a mummy that they just had sitting around, so they tried to give it away. It's not exactly clear what happened to the body in between this and what I'm certain of later, but at some point in the middle of all this, he was being put in somebody's garage, and some kids got a hold of his body and strewn the body parts around the Las Vegas wash. That must have been one heck of a cold case. <laughs> Eventually, the remains were given to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where they remained in the collections there for about a decade. Of course, UNLV really didn't do anything with them, just hold this mummy in safekeeping. So eventually, a lawyer from Pahrump, which is just north of Las Vegas, managed to buy the bones away from UNLV, and eventually put them to rest just beyond Blue Diamond Pass. If you go out hiking, you can still find the gravestone that hilariously misspells his name. So up until a few weeks ago, that was Nevada's worst serial killer. Hell Dorado days have started back up again a few years ago, but I really don't want to see this guy's mummy going around on parade. But that's one of the things that I've learned as a historian, is that some of these people end up getting glorified over time. Kehoe has become somewhat of a legendary figure in Nevada history. Former Senator Reed even wrote an entire article about the guy, well, more of a chapter. It's really bad and do not check it out because Reed doesn't know what he's talking about. Especially when he starts talking about how Kehoe was misunderstood and everybody liked him. No, everybody was afraid of him. He was just like the guy who committed this massacre recently. But we have turned to romanticism to talk about Kehoe. Hopefully that will not happen with this guy. But there is already a disturbing trend. I have heard it from people, I've seen it on Facebook, I've even had to shut down conversations because I heard it going on, but there are people who are starting to conspiracy theorize about this event. And I'm watching this happen to my own city in a way that probably New Yorkers saw all this 9-11 truther stuff coming out after 9-11. It is honestly disturbing because these individuals have 
no clue what they're talking about. They have some sort of hole to pick with it or something along those lines. But what they're doing is romanticizing it so that they can feel better about what happened. It's a way of coping. But it necessarily hurts everyone who's been affected, even people who have been distantly affected like myself, who didn't have any victims that I know directly, but certainly friends of friends. And when somebody starts bringing up that stupid JFK stuff like, oh, what about this shooter on the 12th story or something like that when it's clearly just a reflection, these people are not wanting to deal with reality, so they're making it up. And they'll latch on to anything that they can to fit their own narrative that they want to spin. The problem is, that hurts history a lot. Just like Lost Causers, 9-11 Truthers, JFK Conspiracy Theorists, all of that ilk necessarily make it difficult to research the thing in which they're conspiracy theorizing about, that's happening here, and it needs to stop. Because theorizing is not helping anyone. So if you do meet somebody who's conspiracy theorizing about this, talking about, oh well, the Luxor's a pyramid, and oh no, pyramids... Shut that down. Because they're not only hindering their own perception of reality, they're hindering posterity's ability to do research. As in, my job. And ultimately, conspiracy theorizing hurts the people who were victims. Because there were 500 injured people. Along with the something like 21 to 22,000 people who were there. Lying about history to make yourself feel good only hides the truth and ultimately hurts everyone. And I totally forgot to add this at the end, so I'm doing a second recording. By the way, I did this with absolutely no script, so hopefully I got most of those dates right. But I definitely wanted to hit this subject because, well, it's probably the most important topic around this whole massacre, and that's gun control. I know most people don't want to touch it or want to pontificate about how we need it, but never really go into depth. I will point out that one of the earliest set of episodes on this entire channel were on what the Supreme Court said about the Second Amendment and what the current gun laws were at the federal level. Basically nothing's changed on what I've said in those episodes, so I encourage you guys to go check it out if you want to get a more historical viewpoint. That being said, this guy was using what's called a bump stock, something that basically made the uh, gun fully automatic, well, not really. It basically made him pull the trigger as fast as he possibly could by making it bounce around real quick. And that's how he was able to get out so many rounds so quickly. And here's the thing, we can easily outlaw those. There's no reason to keep them. If we want specific gun control measures, that's one to put in. This is a time in which the tragedy can be used to good effect. It might sound callous, or dare I say cynical, but it is necessary. What will it do for single shooter incidents like this? Uh, probably nothing. I, I, I don't know. That's a thing that no one can answer. We can't exactly follow other countries' examples because, well, we have the Second Amendment and we're not going to amend it anytime soon. But even with a belligerent president like we have right now, I'm pretty sure we could get a ban passed on bump stocks at least. And that might open the door to further legislative possibilities. Of course, every time I hear somebody say, what about reasonable gun control? They're never really willing to elaborate. They'll say like, close the gun show loophole, which really is saying, put out 100% background checks, which is kind of untenable. So we need an issue to kind of force the entire issue. And bump stocks are a pretty good way of getting into that. We have done this before. 
back in 1927, the worst school killing ever happened, and it was done with explosives. That entire weapon class has been eliminated, mostly because of that particular incident. Which, weird callback, but the name of that guy was Kiho as well. Totally unrelated, but yeah. Worst school killer in US history, and second worst serial killer in Nevada history, both named Kiho. But that incident in Michigan led to the 1932 Gun Control Act, or the National Firearms Act is what it's actually called. And it took a series of legislative doors being open in order to get that passed. So there is historical precedent to do this and pass sweeping changes. But we need a issue to focus on, not just sensible gun control, because that's just pablum. So that's how a historian's view kind of gets tweaked with these kinds of events. Now there's a lot of other subjects I could easily have covered, say like how uh, Richard Slotkin would say that this is uh, feeding into mythology, or how Richard Maxwell Brown would call this part of our no duty to retreat attitude. But there's actually a lot of open space for historians to do further study into mass killings like this. There's been plenty of research into Indian massacres and specific events, but nothing as a grand scale trying to draw the narrative all together. And that still really needs to happen. For while this is the most violent recent event, it is by far not the most violent in all of our history.